It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card is designed to help you pay less interest. Unlike other cards, it estimates how much interest you owe and suggests moves to help you pay off your balance faster. Also, you can keep more of your money. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, interest estimates on the payment wheel are illustrative only and may not fully reflect actual interest charges on your account. Estimates are based on your posted account balance at the time of the estimate and do not include pending transactions or any other purchases you may make before the end of the billing period. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card is designed to help you pay less interest. Unlike other cards, it estimates how much interest you owe and suggests moves to help you pay off your balance faster. Also, you can keep more of your money. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, interest estimates on the payment wheel are illustrative only and may not fully reflect actual interest charges on your account. Estimates are based on your posted account balance at the time of the estimate and do not include pending transactions or any other purchases you may make before the end of the billing period. The following podcast includes explicit language, not restricted to words beginning with F, S, B, and Q. Hi, I'm Stefan Fatsis, and this is Slate's Sports Podcast. Hang up and listen for the week of January 30th, 2023. On this week's show, Lindsey Jones of The Ringer will help us break down the NFL Conference Championship games, which were won by the Philadelphia Eagles and the Kansas City Chiefs. Then we'll discuss a New York Times Magazine cover story about college athletic administrators complaining about the effects of college athletes finally making some money. Finally, former U.S. Olympian Edie Tice Morgan will be here to talk about Michaela Schifrin, who's on the verge of becoming the winningest ski racer of all time. I'm the author of Word Freak, A Few Seconds of Panic, and Wild and Outside. I'm in Washington, D.C. Slate staff writer Joel Anderson is in Palo Alto, California. You should listen to him on Slate's daily news podcast, What Next? on the parallels between the police attacks on Tyree Nichols and Rodney King, who is the subject of Joel's Slow Burn Season 6. People should look for uh, What Next? on Tuesday, right, Joel? That's right. It should come out that morning. So it's our biggest podcast. Well, maybe I shouldn't say it's bigger than Hang Up and Listen, but you know, it's uh, no, it's a big deal. That. So yeah, yeah, well, okay, well, yeah, they, they they do pay a lot of bills, but yeah, so I'll I'll uh, I'll be on there Tuesday morning. Slate National Editor Josh Levine is mostly off this week. He'll be here for the college sports conversation only, and Joel's going to stay in the lodge at the bottom of the mountain during the skiing <laughs> segment. In our Slate <laughs> Plus segment this week, we'll talk about LeBron James's epic meltdown on Saturday night in Boston over a missed call and Patrick Beverly's expert use of a prop. To listen to that, you'll need to be a Slate Plus member. You get bonus segments on this and other Slate shows. You get ad-free shows, and you support us to become a member, slate.com slash hangupplus. That's slate.com slash hangupplus. It was the worst of games. It was the best of games. On Sunday in the NFC Championship, the Philadelphia Eagles routed the San Francisco 49ers 31-7, to with the losers playing most of the game without a functioning quarterback which would have been hilarious if it wasn't so sad. Then came the AFC title game between the Kansas City Chiefs and the visiting Cincinnati Bengals. Amazing performances by gimpy Patrick Mahomes and cocky Joe Burrow. Back and forth, 2020 with 17 seconds left. The Chiefs on the Bengals' 47-yard line. And then, here's the call on Bengals radio, collected and tweeted by our friend Timothy Burke. Two receivers out to each side. Mahomes with a deep drop. Now moving in the pocket. Running to the right and running well. He's at the 50. He's trying to run for the first down. He goes out Uh, of bounds. And the Bengals push him after he was out of bounds. Multiple flags are going to tack 15 yards onto this play. Eight seconds left in regulation. And with that penalty, the Chiefs will be in field goal range. 
Harrison Butker nailed the subsequent 45-yarder for the 23-20 win, and the Chiefs made jokes about Burrowhead Stadium and the Bengals' love of cigars. Lindsay Jones of The Ringer joins us now. Hey, Lindsay, welcome back to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, I really want to talk about the Eagles 49ers game because therapy says we should confront our demons, but it would be journalistic malpractice to not lead with Chiefs Bengals. That was an insanely entertaining game, and the only tempering thought I have is sympathy for Cincinnati linebacker Joseph Osai, who pushed Mahomes when he was already out of bounds and drew what was an obvious and deserved unsportsmanlike conduct penalty. Yeah, I mean, CBS didn't help that, right? I mean, they, in, in, as the Chiefs were celebrating, all we got were these camera shots, these lingering shots on Osai, who was so upset. I mean, just completely distraught. And that lasted. I mean, there's um, clips of his post game interviews that are going around Twitter today where he's clearly really upset in the locker room. And a lot of his teammates are kind of coming to his defense and like supporting him. But yeah, I mean, that was just a really, really tough moment because. You get what he was doing, right? I mean, he had a really good game. He was getting after Patrick Mahomes all game, and he was doing everything he possibly could to try to stop Patrick Mahomes from getting a first down in that scenario. And those type of hits happen all the time. It wasn't malicious. He wasn't, like, trying to have a dirty hit or whatever. It's just so close. But also, like, they had to throw the flag in that situation, right? right? Like, it felt bad that there was a 15-yard penalty added there, but it's going to happen Every single quarterback is going to get that call. That wasn't a special Patrick Mahomes hit. No, it was the it was the most obvious flag in the in the history of flags, Joel. And but you know it, it was a bad play. But he's operating on instinct and the speed of the game. It's impossible to understand unless you played or stood on the sidelines. I understand what happened. Yeah, I mean, I totally understood what happened in the moment. It just is the kind of thing that can happen. And I don't know if you all were reminded at all of the. Um, 2000 it was a 2019 AFC championship game when D Ford lined up offsides and you know negated an interception that would have ended that game and it just felt a, very much the same to me there's just like man look I'm sorry it happened to you it didn't have to be you but like they have to throw that flag they have to make that call in that situation oh or, I don't know what actually I did see uh your boss for instance Lindsay say that they can't throw Bill Simmons say that they can't throw that flag in that moment. Um what do you what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean there's been a lot of discourse about the officiating um in the last, you know, 12 hours or however long it's been basically is there were some issues in the NFC game, there were a lot of officiating questions in the second half especially of the AFC game and a lot of discourse about like what should the official officials been, be inserting themselves and when should they remove themselves? But like when a quarterback gets hit out of bounds, his foot was already out of bounds. I mean, you kind of, they kind of have to maintain some sort of, you know, rule book. Like he was like, he yeah. was like three feet. He was like out to the white bounds. part of the sideline. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there were a lot more egregious right. officiating issues that we probably should be discussing and not that final play. I mean, ultimately, that 15 yard penalty made it an easy field goal for Harrison Bucker, a guy who has not been automatic this season. But if we want to really get into like the officiating issues from this weekend, it it went way deeper and way earlier in the games than that final flag. Tell me what you thought about officiating this weekend, then, because you're right; it was the it was a driving narrative. I mean, for I mean, in both games, right, that people were complaining about, you know, the amount of flags that the 49ers got in their game, and then of course, you know, the Bengals, um, you know, had got a lot of flags in this game. So, what did you did you think that? officiating was abnormally bad this weekend? No, no. And we actually, we talked about this on uh, Slow News Day with Kevin Clark that we recorded this morning. I don't think it was <sighs> abnormally bad. The problem is, is we're just used to big officiating questions in these big moments. I mean, it happens every single Sunday. We find a new and infuriating way to question how the, how the officials are getting something wrong. Um, it just feels heightened in these moments when everybody is watching one game. It is the top teams, the top quarterbacks, um, and we expect everybody to be operating um, on the highest level. And we just keep seeing time and time again how fallible everybody is, right? That these, you know, these are humans making these decisions in, you know, a a lot of times judgment calls. In real time in a sport that moves at a thousand miles an hour. Yeah, exactly. And so it's it's just really like, we can't expect ever to be a a perfectly officiated game. Um, The problem that I see for the NFL coming out of this is that there's so much discourse 
online during the games that there's something nefarious happening that the game is rigged and they're being these games are being called in the favor of one team versus the other team and I know that's how a lot of Bengals fans feel and that's probably how a lot of people actually play for the Bengals and the coaches feel even though if they might not be publicly saying it because Zach Taylor could get fined from here to the sun if he were to say that the game is rigged <laughs> the game was rigged he's not going to say that but in reality it's more just the nature of officiating and human error and the the challenge that they have to get these games right. Um, There have been worse issues in playoff games. You mentioned the D Ford question, which was like, that was a real questionable call when it happened. And then obviously that, that same, um, it was that same postseason, right? The same championship day with the non pass interference call with the Rams and the saints. I mean, that was was the worst blown call I think that we've ever seen in a really, really high leverage moment. Mm -hmm. Um, it's the problem is, is that there were so many people that were saying, oh, my God, this has to be rigged. And the appearance, the appearance of impropriety is a problem, especially given, you know, how much money is going into gambling and all that stuff these days. And that's why I think it's an issue. And the the, the question I have is whether the NFL is going to be forced at some point, the competition committee, to look at more VAR type um, solutions here to help assist the referees in a way that doesn't slow the game down quite as much as it could. But ultimately, this game, you know, sure, you can say was decided. The Chiefs weren't called for a, a roughing the passer penalty on the previous series. Yeah, there was the, uh, the, the intentional grounding call. There was that weird third down that got replayed. Yeah. There's been a lot of Zapruder-like holding calls with big circles around dudes hugging each other in the backfield. But ultimately, Cincinnati's offensive line was completely dominated by the Chiefs. Um, uh, Patrick Mahomes, once again, when he needed to, found a way to run. I mean, that was the only time he basically ran all game, uh, was on that scramble to get out of bounds with eight seconds to go. And Patrick Mahomes' performance, I mean, the one pass, his touchdown pass, was just an unbelievably athletic piece of artwork um, to uh, Marquez Valdez-Scantling. And uh, you, you just watch what he does week in, week out, and you are blown away. And this is someone who was probably put together with athletic tape and Toradol during the week. Right. Well, I, I, And I want to ask you all about that. And, 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 and Lindsay, you, you know, you can feel free to go here, but have you ever seen Mahomes better in terms of performance times degree of difficulty? Because... I mean, we didn't, when I saw him get hurt the week before, I didn't think he was even going to play. Like, it was sort of shocking to me that he was able to play, but then that he excelled against a defense that he's been struggling with. Like, I just, I I find it hard to believe that anybody could have played better under those circumstances. Yeah, I mean, we've seen him come back from injury quickly throughout his career um, and play through stuff that most guys wouldn't be able to play through multiple times before. I mean, he had a kind of a debilitating toe injury a couple seasons ago. And that was one they said that actually probably hampered him the most because of planting the toe pain was just was just really, really intense. But I remember during I guess it was the 2019 season the when they won their first Super Bowl a couple seasons ago. Um, I was at the I believe was it a Thursday night game or a Monday night game? It was a primetime game in Denver when he dislocated his kneecap. And I remember sitting in the press box and all of a sudden you see him on the ground and the linemen are on top of him and you can just see the looks on their faces. And I was like, anybody but Patrick, like I will give, I will, I will give my knee right now for <laughs> you know the, the best player in the NFL. And like, he only missed a couple games and I think he was actually ready. He felt he was ready to come back sooner. And the chiefs had to be like, let's just give it like one more week, dude, before you're out here running away. So we, we have a fairly substantial body of evidence of this guy's body is just not like anybody else's. Um, And, you know, a high ankle sprain. He just came back from it faster. Um, He talked to Peter King after the game, if you read Peter King's column this morning. And there was a lot of stuff of realizing that, like, it hurt a lot. And when he ran, he knew that it was going to hurt and it didn't feel right and that he might potentially be doing some more damage. That's why I'm curious to see. I want to see how he came out of this game. Luckily, he's got two weeks, you know, if there was any additional damage. But, you know, he's got the combination of probably a abnormally fast healing body and just this ability to like play through pain, like an intense pain tolerance, uh, mental fortitude that I personally cannot fathom. All right. So Eagles 49ers, Joel Brock Purdy, Mm -hmm. uh, the Mr. Irrelevant quarterback who doesn't lose for the 49ers. Mm -hmm. 
got hurt. He got, uh, looks like, possible UCL injury in his elbow. His backup, the 97-year-old Josh Johnson, came in the game. He got concussed on a hit where his head crashed against the turf. And that basically left the 49ers without a quarterback. At one point, they were having Christian McCaffrey test out a helmet with the radio in it. And Purdy ended up playing and just handing the ball off. And yeah. it just made the game so sad and, and pathetic. Um, and on the one hand, you could say, oh, bad luck for the 49ers. Or as former NFL lineman Marcus Spears tweeted, this is football and pass rush is a part of the game. It's not bad luck. It's getting your ass tore up in the line of scrim mm-hmm. on the line of scrimmage. The Eagles D line is the reason this is like it is. Yeah, Hassan Reddick got got to him, hit him, and that's like what you're kind of hoping happens if you're a defense that you get to the quarterback and you knock him out of the game. I think the thing that actually, um, and I heard Alex Smith bring this up on ESPN Daily. Um, there's no longer any third string quarterbacks in the NFL. Like you know they. It's been since 2011 when they abolished the third quarterback rule. And I don't, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like, it doesn't cost the NFL anything extra to have another quarterback. And I mean, you're really playing a dangerous game if you've only got two quarterbacks because, like, if a team is getting overwhelmed on the offensive line, if a defensive line is overwhelming the offensive line, it's not hard to imagine a scenario in which both of the, those guys get hurt. Um, and so that game was pretty much over after the sixth offensive play, even though the 49ers sort of hung in there. But I just, it would have been nice if, you know, I mean, even, I, you know, somebody tweeted it. Like, even if Ryan Leaf or, I don't know, Steve Young or Brian, Nick Ryan Mullins. Ryan Greasy is the quarterback's coach. Right. He was standing there on the sideline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, somebody that has some experience throwing a ball in an NFL game. Don't you, It just would have been so much better if we had had somebody else. I don't think the NFL would ever want to see something like that happens again. So that that rule has to change, right? I'm going to be very curious this offseason if there is some sort of adjustment made. Um, but there is the, you know, the issue of like, it's it's the end of January. Like there weren't a lot of quarter. I mean, the Niners were right. down. Josh Johnson was QB4 that they had brought in. They have Jimmy Garoppolo sitting there waiting that hopefully they were kind of hoping that maybe he would be cleared enough that he could have been, at, you know, been on the active roster as a backup this week. He wasn't quite there. You know, who else were they going to sign? I mean, there's um, not a lot of good quarterbacks out there to go three or four deep around the league. I mean, I think that's one of the, you know, I guess one of the problems. Um, even if there had been that emergency QB rule, the Niners just didn't have anybody. They didn't have anybody sitting there on their practice squad that they could have, you know, even But isn't activated. that the Niners' fault, Lindsay? Yeah. I mean, like, as Joel was pointing out, surely you're anticipating that the worst could happen. You're playing... An incredible defense, you're starting Mr. Irrelevant, and your backup is a guy that's barely played. Yeah, I mean— Don't you want to, like, isn't—doesn't some of the blame here fall on the team? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, that you—that this is the— the give and take, right? So in 2001, when they abolished the third emergency quarterback rule, they expanded rosters to or the game day rosters from 45 to 48 on game day with the idea that it would give teams more flexibility, that they could have a quarterback than a third quarterback um, on the game day roster. Uh, in the 2020 CBA, they expanded it to 48, but eight of those players have to be linemen. So you'd think there'd be room to maybe have a quarterback. Most teams don't do it, though. They just well, they don't they roll wanna... the dice. They don't want to leave that space to a guy that's most likely not going to play. Like, yeah. it's very right. rare, right? But it, it <laughs> you never know, right? You just yeah. never know. And and then you got, I mean, even getting down to Josh Johnson in and of itself, like, we sort of took for granted, like, maybe the 49ers should have been bad previously. Like, it's by a miracle of circumstance that Brock Purdy was a capable quarterback. Yeah, right? I mean, it's one of the most incredible stories that we've seen in the NFL in 25 years that the last pick in the draft went what won seven straight games after being inserted into the lineup in December and was better than the two guys that he had replaced. I mean, that that doesn't happen, right? That's like storybook. They're gonna they would make movies about that. So the fact that we would expect that Josh Johnson would then come in, uh, I mean, it was a huge credit to Kyle Shanahan to get Purdy into that situation. A huge credit to Purdy that he played as well as he did, but it all unraveled. Pretty, pretty quickly. All right, so we've got two weeks before the uh, the Super Bowl, Joel. All right, the main storylines are going to be Chiefs' third Super Bowl in four seasons, Andy Reid playing Philly, where he coached for 14 years and blew a Super Bowl with awful clock management. And if there's ever been a case of someone rewriting his narrative, 
it's Andy Reid. Mm-hmm. Incredible. And the third and most annoying storyline is going to be Travis and Jason Kelsey playing for the opposing teams. That is going to be incredibly annoying. But Joel, it's also the, going to be the first Super Bowl with two black starting quarterbacks. Right. Um, I really am glad you mentioned that because so I covered the 2017 national championship game between Alabama and Georgia when, Sab- when Nick Saban benched Jalen Hurts at halftime and started Tua um, after in the second half. And so at that point, I'm looking at his career and I'm like, oh, well, Jalen is a good college quarterback, but he there's a ceiling. Never going to get any better than here. I hope he can figure out something to do after college football is over. Uh, and so that he is here right now is unbelievable. But the, the other piece of that narrative, like I want to give Jalen Hurts all the props. Like I would have never expected his career to take on this trajectory, to be a NFL MVP candidate. It's remarkable. And it's a testament to coach his son, worked really hard, did all the development. I have not seen anybody come from where he was to where he is now. Like, I just, I know Josh Allen was always sort of a toolsy guy and everybody sort of thought he would be good, but I don't, I would have never expected this for Jalen Hurts. But um, can we talk about this? Jalen Hurts' next good playoff game will probably be his first one, right? Like, he didn't, it ain't like he played well on Sunday, right? Yeah, I mean, his best, his best pass wasn't actually a completion. So that fourth yeah. and three Devonta Smith that that Smith didn't actually catch. Um, right. I mean, they they counted it as a catch, but go back officiating, it wasn't a catch. Um, he had a couple uh, really good scrambles in the second half. Took a couple like probably hits that I was like, let's get him out of this game. Let's let's <laughs> not subject this guy there. Um, but yeah, I mean, their offense hasn't been at its best. I mean, really since he got hurt. But two weeks. We'll we'll see. I mean, really, the heart and soul of that team is their is their offensive lines, and if the, that group is healthy, Lane Johnson was a maniac uh, in the NFC Championship game. It's going to make Jalen Hurts look really good, and I would love to see him kind of rise, rise to that occasion of you know he the knock on the Eagles right is that they haven't beaten anybody really good. They haven't you know beaten the the elite quarterbacks in the NFL. They're going to get the chance now. And if Mahomes can, or if Hertz can outduel Mahomes, we won't be concerned about their average offense in late December and mid January. And the one thing I like about Hertz on the Eagles, Joel, is that there's a legacy in Philadelphia of black quarterback. Mm-hmm. And ESPN in November did a yep. roundtable on how and why black quarterbacks have succeeded more in Philly than anywhere Randall Cunningham, Donovan McNabb, Michael Vick, Rodney Pete, yeah. uh, RG. RG3 interviewed Vic McNabb and Jalen Hurts sitting on the steps inside the Philly Museum of Art. And it's really worth watching. Yeah, no, Philly's kind of got like that uh, Houston, Tennessee legacy where it's like Warren Moon to Steve McNair to Vince Young. Uh, well, you know, they kind of that that <laughs> that that uh, line ended there. But um, yeah, it's kind of I've always sort of followed and rooted for Philly. I mean, hey, look, I. I mean, fans, I just have to admit this. Like, when you were growing up in the 80s or 90s and a team had a black quarterback, uh, as a black football fan, you probably rooted for that team because you wanted to see black quarterbacks succeed. So um, that we're here at this point where a guy like Jalen Hurts even gets the opportunity to play in the NFL and thrive and somebody build an offense around him. You know, Pat Mahomes is great. He was going to be good regardless under any circumstance, but um, Jalen Hurts is sort of a testament to the change, the evolving attitudes about the black quarterback in the NFL that a guy can't improve and you can build an offense around him. And so, yeah, that's, that's kind of cool. I mean, that doesn't mean I'm a root for the Eagles, uh, (laughs) but I'm sorry, but um, it's, it's, it's nice to see. It's nice to see something like that. Yeah. And these are two really likable quarterbacks too. just, in, you know, you can tell that the way that their teammates uh, respond to both of them, their investment in their teams and in their communities. Uh, they're two, maybe the two first feminist quarterbacks in the NFL. Uh, Patrick Mahomes has uh, joined his wife as being a part owner of an NWSL team. Um, Jalen Hurts has an all female management team, agent, um, marketing rep, everything. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, Houston, a, there's the a lot of great, yeah, Texas, Texas, high, and a lot of Texas high school football. Yep. Uh, in this yep. matchup to uh, to Texas kids. So yeah, real a lot of fun storylines beyond just the the Kelsey brothers who are also star podcasters uh, in addition to their football prowess. Are, are people just playing? Because I just, I cannot imagine people actually caring about the Kelsey. I mean, I know it's, maybe it's cool. They're good talkers. And I'm just like, I mean, is that really, are people really that interested in the Kelsey brothers? No, just, yeah, oh, I mean, it's, I think it's going to be more of like a TV storyline. Their, their, their parents are going to get a ton of, 
a ton of play. I mean, I think you could probably, there's going to be some prop bets on how many shots we're going to get of his, their parents. What's cool about it, I think of that is that it's not just like, yeah, hey, there's two brothers playing. It's like, they're two all pros. Like they right. are the two of the very central members of their teams. I mean, you could make a pretty strong argument that the Eagles offense runs through Jason Kelsey and everything he does at center. I mean, he's like a future Hall of Famer, Travis Kelsey, future Hall of Famer, tight end. If they're going to win that game, he needs to have a huge game. So I think that helps with it. Um, but yeah, big. I, it's it's probably more of like a Fox TV thing. Lindsay Jones writes about the NFL for The Ringer. Lindsay, thank you for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me. Up next, we'll talk about the New York Times Magazine's cover story, student athlete mogul, about whether college athletes are making too much money. time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card is designed to help you pay less interest. Unlike other cards, it estimates how much interest you owe and suggests moves to help you pay off your balance faster. Also, you can keep more of your money. Apply now on the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, interest estimates on the payment wheel are illustrative only and may not fully reflect actual interest charges on your account. Estimates are based on your posted account balance at the time of the estimate and do not include pending transactions or any other purchases you may make before the end of the billing period. This episode of Hang Up and Listen is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now, getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Last week, the New York Times Magazine published a big feature by Bruce Schoenfeld with the headline, Student, Athlete, Mogul? I hope my intonation indicated where the question mark was. The story focuses on the University of North Carolina, where four starters from the men's basketball team that made last year's title game decided to come back to school in part because of name, image, and likeness rules, deals that allow them to make money while still being in college. Armando Baycott is now driving an $80,000 Audi and has deals that add up to around $400,000 for the year. Not bad for a guy who's not currently on NBA draft boards. But Joel, this piece is mostly not focusing on the positive. The North Carolina athletic director, Bubba Cunningham, suggests that with money now going to individual athletes like Baycott rather than to the athletic department as a whole, lower revenue sports could suffer and maybe be on the chopping block entirely. What did you make of that argument and what did you think of the piece as a whole? Yeah, so let's uh, just take a 10,000 foot look at this. To the extent that fault or blame must be assigned to this current situation, North Carolina Athletic Director Bubba Cunningham and the New York Times placed it in exactly the wrong place. It should be placed on the NCAA and all of its member institutions. And everything that's happening right now, and I cannot emphasize this enough, used to happen under the table or in such a way that athletes were severely limited in their options. And so this story touches lightly on the situation that has roiled college sports fans, that of Jaden Rashada, a four-star QB from the Bay Area. He originally committed to Miami, then decommitted, committed to Florida with the promise of $13 million deal. 
And then when it turned out that the Gator Collective, which supports the University of Florida, didn't have the money, he backed out of that commitment. And now he's, you know, on the market again. So all this used to happen before. Athletes would sign a NLI, not an NIL, a National Letter of Intent, and it basically bound you to the school no matter what. You had to go through a number of steps to transfer. And even if you were being mistreated or weren't being treated fairly, you were still there. So all of the power was with the current athletic administration at that school. So you could sign an NLI and still not even be guaranteed admission to that particular school. That's how bad it was, right? In terms of boosters promising money to athletes, let's not be babies. Like, they've been doing this promising money and enticements to athletes from the very start. They might say, hey, look, we're going to give you $100,000. Here's $20,000 for your signature. And if the athlete accepted that under-the-table deal, which was more common than many people might think, they were stuck. There was nothing that would compel the school to deliver on the rest of that $100,000 and the athlete's eligibility was at the mercy of the booster or the athletic department. That is the Jaden Rashada experience. And of course, there was no way for athletes to avail themselves of the money that schools owed them through price fixing and, and other licensing and endorsement deals, which is how the O'Bannon versus NCAA and the Alston versus NCAA cases picked up steam and worked their way through the courts to the benefit of athletes. So all of this is the fault of the heavy-handed leadership of the NCAA and its membership institutes. And now the athletes finally have a way to avail themselves of the millions that were denied to them for so long. And after all that, these people still fail to take responsibility and work toward a better and more equitable system. They still want control. So here's the thing. Why should we care that millionaires are going to have to adjust to a changing industry and changing times? People like professional sports. They follow them more fervently than college sports. And in that story that we're talking about, not once did anyone question the current collegiate athletic model. Why is it so obvious that we should keep it the way that it is? Bubba Cunningham makes $1.2 million a year and doesn't want to figure out ways to keep advertisers and boosters interested in donating money to the school. He got a raise of $400,000 literally a few months ago. Likely while he was worrying where the UNC's next check is coming from. Why should we feel sorry for him? Mac Brown makes $5 million a year. And the average college football compensation for the 108 NCAA Division I coaches, which is different from FBS, is like close to $2 million. And I hear that Mac Brown maybe doesn't want to have to do the work of roster management, convincing Drake May of reasons to stay at the school. Why should I feel sorry for him? So I guess, Stefan, I'm just curious as to like, Why is there some public interest in ensuring that Josh Downs, the North Carolina receiver, has to fend off offers from Nissan or United Healthcare for sponsorship at a possible cost to the North Carolina Athletic Department? This article did not make the case for why we should care. What this article did was take one complaint from a prominent athletic director at a major institution and elevate it into a crisis for college sports. And the crisis is if money is getting delivered to athletes from sponsors, from these newly formed collectives, from donors and boosters, then that money will not be going directly to the athletic department. And it's the same sky is falling argument that we've heard for years. Before NIL, the argument was, if we have to pay players, there won't be any money for smaller sports. And now the argument is, if we don't have to pay players, and some Mm -hmm. players get paid anyway, there still isn't going to be enough money for smaller Mm -hmm. sports. So this is what these institutions do. Rather than, as you pointed out accurately, Joel, suggesting solutions, coming up with ways to generate more revenue if that is what's needed to happen, or with cutting expenses if maybe that's what should happen, they move the goalposts in the court of public opinion. Mac Brown is a 71-year-old white dude who has spent his entire career exploiting black athletes for his own benefit. And he comes off as the voice of reason in this story, which to me is hilarious. Um, you said that Bubba Cunningham gets $1.25 million. That's his base salary, Joel. He also will get another hundred grand if the UNC men's basketball team wins the national championship this year. Unmentioned in the story... Josh, is that UNC's chances of winning the national championship and Cunningham getting his bonus and, oh, by the way, UNC's ability to market 
and generate more sponsorship, improving because their team does really, really well and wins a national title, are enhanced by these players staying at school. You want more revenue? Find ways to generate it. Having four starters from your NCAA finalist team return for another year is a pretty good indication that you're going to generate more revenue in the coming year. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, sometimes a story can be annoying because the people in the story say annoying things and the writer accurately reflects what the people say. And so it's not necessarily the writer's fault. I do feel like it is useful and valuable to have Bubba Cunningham in here saying the things that he said, even if we don't agree with them. I think the issue with the story as it's conceived is that the claims that he's making are not contextualized in the way that you guys just did, that there's not a rebuttal from an economist saying, yeah, this is what college athletic departments and athletic directors always say. And it's just they're adapting their usual talking points to this new era. Matt Brown, who does a newsletter, Extra Points, had a nice kind of tidy rebuttal of this story where he kind of mentioned one of the one of the stranger arguments of the piece, which is the one athlete that they really talked to, and Baycott and, and the others from the basketball team are not, I don't think, actually interviewed. They're not quoted, at least in the piece, which is a little bit strange. But there's a field hockey player who is quoted extensively in the story, Aaron Matson, who's the best field hockey player in America. And there's some kind of concern expressed in the piece that she's making $50,000 in NIL over two seasons at the only national deal she has her endorsements targeted toward other field hockey players, which is just kind of a bizarre thing to be concerned or surprised about. And as Matt Brown notes, there needs to be a quality of opportunity here, not a quality of outcomes. Like the fact that Aaron Matson is making what the market will bear for her, which is, you know, a market that's set based on how many people play watch and care about field hockey, the fact that she's able to to monetize her value there is what's important here. Not that she makes less money than a guy, Armando Baycott, who's more well-known. And that, I think, Joel, is just one of, one of many kind of misperceptions or, or misconceptions that's in the story. And, you know, I, I think it would be appropriate to do a big feature on like how crazy the situation is with collectives right now. And the Rashada story with him getting $13 million and the offer getting rescinded and, you know, him going from Miami to Florida to now basically being a free agent. That is like a legitimately fascinating story. And I think it's one that I would have loved the New York Times magazine to devote a feature treatment to. And it's one where I think, again, the like schools and the athletic departments are, are villains, but also like the collectives themselves are not, you know, necessarily the clean living paragons of, of virtue. And there are people in, in there that are operating in a way that uh, I'm sure is, you know, weird and sleazy. Um, but, you know, that, that's, that's what we should be digging into here. Right. I mean, the Gator Collective welched on their deal. Do you all know, by the way, where Jaden Rashada, with three schools he's visiting or has visited by any chance? What are they? Arizona State, his father's alma mater. He, his, his father was a college football player in the 90s. Colorado, uh, unsurprisingly, home of Deion Sanders and TCU. <laughs> those, those are his next three visits. But And TCU, just, he would go there because of Sonny Dykes' coaching, because of the pedigree <laughs> yeah. of the program. Right. I'm yeah, sure play that for Kendall Brown, the rich probably. tradition, I think, is what yeah. you're looking for there. And they, yeah. would, they would not offer him any money. It would just be for the love of the no. game. Good school. I mean, that, that TCU degree, you see where I'm at today, guys. But I'm so glad that you mentioned Aaron Matson, who is great and uh, does make money. And Stefan touched on this, too. It's hard not to read the story and the gripes within and feel that it's a lot of concern trolling about black athletes in the revenue generating sports making more than they should. And I'm looking at the headline image in that New York Times yes. story. It's a really arresting image. This is in my Armando Baycott. Yeah, stepping out of his Carolina blue Audi Q8. 
And it's meant to convey something to readers who aren't as well informed about the dynamics at play here. And it got me thinking about, do people really know or care about the purpose of these non-revenue sports? And if they don't, I might recommend a piece from The Athletic in 2018, which is headlined, College Sports Are Affirmative Action for Rich White Students. The subhead is, athletes are often held to a lower standard by admissions officers, and in the Ivy League, 65% of players are white. So... In these sports, the barrier for entry is extremely high. One study found that like one in five families of elite high school athletes spend $1,000 a month on sports, right? Kids from low-income sports participate in youth sports at almost half the rate of affluent families, and that money is one of the reasons. So in that way, these non-revenue-producing sports are most likely the largest affirmative action program that exists in colleges today, and they largely benefit white students. And by, by, by the National Collegiate Athletic Association's own estimate, 61% of student-athletes last year were white. And in that story, it cited a study that looked at 30 selective colleges and found that athletes were given a 48% boost in admissions compared with 25% for legacies and 18% for racial minorities. So in that way... You can see these non-revenue sports as part of a larger scheme to manipulate the admissions process for colleges and universities. And this is like one of the few areas of American life where there's this concern about the equality of opportunity and income. Like, I'm supposed to be concerned that Armando Baycock has an Audi Q8 when he earned that? So, Stefan, I don't know. Like, again, I come back to the piece again, and I'm not, I don't mean to go so hard on the piece but I think the underlying assumptions really bother me. But I don't know why I should give a fuck about fencing or sailing students or any other sport where the barrier for entry is thousands of dollars that most other parents don't have. And they're not getting their fair share. That's not even where I thought you were going to go with that, Joel. I actually thought mm. you were going to say that running a photograph of an African-American basketball player getting out of a fancy mm -hmm. booster supplied car is like the oldest cliche in college yep. sports. Oh, yep. my God, he's driving a fancy car. Where <laughs> did he get it? Ooh. And the way it's even referred to in the piece is that Baycott was, quote, openly driving an $80,000 <laughs> Audi. Openly, openly yeah. driving. And the, but the second point you make about the Ivy League and whether we should feel badly for fencers and field hockey players who have been, you know, spending tens of thousands of dollars to get good at their sports as children is something that Bubba Cunningham says in the piece. He says the Ivy League has it right. And by right, he must mean that Ivy League athletes don't get any scholarships, they have less exposure, and they have less opportunity to capitalize off of their abilities. And by the way, athletic directors at Ivy League schools don't make $1.25 million plus say, uh, ridiculous bonuses. So be careful what you wish for, Bubba Cunningham. So Bubba Cunningham wrote a letter to donors that said, we support our student athletes' ability to profit from their NIL. We thank those who have already contributed to their efforts to date, and we encourage you to assist the collectives and marketplaces that empower their success. Nick Saban, who, in a hilarious and public dispute with Jimbo Fisher of Texas A&M, accused A&M of buying their recruiting class, <laughs> is now presiding over a university that is opening, what's it called? The Advantage Center? A first of its kind <laughs> dedicated NIL hub. Um, Defector had a nice post about it, um, making the point that, and I quote, these schools are put in a position where they have to spend millions of dollars to build a ludicrous conference center in order to help the players get paid by anyone else but them. Mm -hmm. So what, what we're seeing here is, whether it's Nick Saban or whether it's Bubba Cunningham, I don't think it's necessarily hypocrisy, but... The stuff that they're saying about NIL and about how it's wrong and bad while they're encouraging donors and they're trying to broadcast also to incoming athletes that they're the best at getting them NIL. Again, it's sort of like tired to say that it's hypocritical. It's just they're talking to different audiences. Right. Like Bubba Cunningham is trying to I guess, talk to Washington, D.C. here, like trying to get some sort of legislation to control this, however that would happen. I guess he's also just trying to broadcast to his audience of fellow athletic directors and university presidents that he's sensible and reasonable and wants to keep these athletes in line. 
while he's also trying to tell those athletes and boosters, like, give us money because, Mm -hmm. you know, we're all adults here and we really know what's going on. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I actually was thinking you talking about the audience here. I'm reading this long, ponderous story about the stakes at play here based in North Carolina. And I find it interesting that this story was written and didn't mention Taylor Branch, the historian and prominent UNC alum. And as far as I know, he's alive and well. And the reason I say that is because all of this is a deflection. It's a tangent. It's a digression. Because fundamentally, athlete pay in colleges is still a civil rights issue. And Taylor Branch is the one who has made the very best case for why that's so. And I encourage people to revisit his opus from 2011, The Shame of College Sports, which also ran in the, the Atlantic. And he wrote in that piece, the tragedy at the heart of college sports is not that some college athletes are getting paid, but that more of them are not. And because at the end of the day, none of this truly rectifies the fundamental unfairness of the situation here. And NIL is just a scheme to nibble at the edges. The system is not going to be fair or equitable until the athletes get their piece of the billions in TV revenue. Like you said, Josh, like it's a way to find everybody to pay these guys except the colleges themselves. College athletics are already fully commercialized with little difference in presentation from the professional versions. Very little of this has to do with education. And I don't think anybody actually gives a shit about any of that because none of us know who the hell is on the academic All-American teams. So at the end of the day, for me, like if this requires a breakup of the NCAA or if they've got to figure out another way to support these athletic departments, then they need to do it. And I don't think we'll miss it. Again, Bubba Cunningham and the piece itself did not make the argument for why college sports should be under this model as it is right now. There's a whole other spigot of money, a whole spigot of cash that these guys are not, that they earned that they're not getting a piece of. And that's the real issue here. Not that Armando Baycott gets, you know, Audi and and a field hockey player doesn't. I'm sorry. And it's also that it's not a zero-sum game, which is what they want to argue. Mm -hmm. This argument that, oh, if Bojangles sponsors UNC's quarterback instead of giving a hundred grand to sponsor, you know, to put a a decal on the on the wall at a arena, that's a hundred grand that UNC's not gonna get. Wrong. There's another fast food chain that would be happy to step in and support UNC athletics and try to get undergraduates to go eat more fast food. Um, These are a lot of false choices being presented here. And the ones that aren't being presented are that there's got to be a way to pay everybody or pay the, the players who deserve to be paid out of that revenue pool you mentioned, Joel, and also that the money already exists, that Universities choose to pay coaches what they pay and to build new facilities for athletes and to pay administrators, you know, over a million dollars a year and to join conferences that require hundreds of thousands of dollars in travel expenses every year. These are choices that universities make and UNC ain't making them because no one else is making them. And until somebody decides to make them, you're going to continue to get these these sky is falling arguments that fail to address the real issues in college sports. The most fascinating scene in the story for me, and this is my last thought, is that um, a North Carolina collective put on a basketball Hmm. scrimmage and it was sponsored by United Healthcare, which is not a UNC sponsor. They weren't allowed to wear their team uniforms or have, it was like, you know, an unlicensed video game, how you you don't get to use the the uniforms or or anything like that. But these were the players for the team collectively being paid by a collective (laughs) because they play basketball in North Carolina and the school gets none of the money, the school gets none of the shine and it all goes to the players. And it seems like I can totally understand why the school and the athletic department would want to use every argument at its yeah. disposal and use the megaphone of the New York Times mm-hmm. to argue that this should not be allowed, that this can't go on, that this can't exist, that it imperils them. And if I were a player in reading this, that's the paragraph that I would take away. It's like, we can stage our own Yep. scrimmages our own events and just get paid for them directly as a team and just call ourselves the you know heart heels or whatever like that seems like a good, that seems like a good deal to me 
<laughs> yeah. And, you know, uh, my last thought here. Yo, man, that's a great point, Josh. And you know what, Bubba? If it's so fucking bad, take a pay cut. Up next, Stefan will talk to former Olympic skier Edie Tice Morgan about Michaela Schifrin, who is poised to break the all-time record for World Cup ski race victories. Time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card is designed to help you pay less interest. Unlike other cards, it estimates how much interest you owe and suggests moves to help you pay off your balance faster. Also, you can keep more of your money. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, interest estimates on the payment wheel are illustrative only and may not fully reflect actual interest charges on your account. Estimates are based on your posted account balance at the time of the estimate and do not include pending transactions or any other purchases you may make before the end of the billing period. In Italy last Tuesday, Michaela Schifrin won a World Cup race for the 83rd time, passing fellow American Lindsey Vaughn for most career victories by a woman. The next day, on the same mountain, she won another race, her 84th, leaving her too short of Swedish legend Ingemar Stenmark's overall record, which has stood since 1989. The tour moved on to its next event in the Czech Republic, and on Saturday, Schifrin's slalom went like this. Michaela Schifrin staring down the barrel of history. Ingemar Stenmark's record of 86. As she gets closer and closer, the closer she gets, the faster she goes. Michaela Schifrin absolutely on a tear right now, and she has got it! A massive win! Lightning in a bottle for Michaela Schifrin. Joining me now is Edie Teese Morgan, who skied for the United States in the 1988 and 1992 Olympics, and now writes about the sport for Ski Magazine and other outlets. Hey, Edie, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. So on Saturday, it was 85. And then on Sunday, on the same hill in the Czech Republic, Schifrin lost another slalom by just six one hundredths of a second, the narrowest margin of her career. And now the chase for 86 will have to wait a few weeks until the World Cup tour resumes in early March. Barring injury, though, it seems certain that Schifrin will get there this winter. She's won 11 of 22 starts this season. Edie, as a former elite skier, Year, put into context just how remarkable this career accomplishment by Schifrin is. Well, I, I mean, it's incredible. And like you said, I think the most incredible thing is how much runway she has left. You know, so getting to 82, 85 victories, you know, wherever she's going, it, as far as she's come this far, you know, Lindsey Vaughn got there when she was, I think, 32. Stenmark when he or Stenmark at 32, Lindsey at 33. And both of them, it took Stenmark three years to get his last three victories. It took Vaughn patching herself together every time she got in the starting gate. And Schifrin has never had a major injury. She is 27. She's got nine more races this year alone where she could get to that record. So she just, I think the remarkable thing is how much runway she has in front of her and how loose she is. She's just, she's having fun with it. She doesn't feel any pressure to get the record because she's so close to it and because she has so much runway. And and she's getting better in every event. You know, she's she's not like cruising through and eking out these victories. I mean, I think actually her not winning this last race was great because it shows how hard it is. Each of these victories are very hard. They're not there's no gimmies. There's not nothing she's done before is giving her extra credit when she gets in the start gate. And that, that's one of the amazing things about the accomplishment here. You mentioned how much runway she has. Vaughn, 82 wins, 395 World Cup starts. Schifrin did it in 233 starts. I mean, that's insane. That's 160 fewer races, and it's like a 35% win rate for Schifrin. And this is a sport, Edie, where, where racers go years without winning because of what you mentioned, because of how competitive it is and because of the na the margins are so narrow in ski racing. Yeah, it's amazing. And the, f the fact that she's just completely, she's not stressing about any of this stuff now, 
And, and her, her podium, I mean, her win percentage is 35%. Her podium percentage is like over 50%. She's just always there. Like Vaughn, she started out doing all the events and then she kind of specialized in speed. Schifrin started out in slalom and she kind of, she's kind of expanding from there. Now she's totally dominating in giant slalom. She's always a threat in super G. You never really know in downhill. I mean, the only thing limiting her is her time to spend training all these events because you just physically can't do it. And yet she's found a way, you know, instead of when she goes to speed, yes, that gives the other, the women in tech time to, to rest, time to train at their craft. And yet she gets something extra out of speed and brings it back to tech that makes her tech better. So, you know, you sort of just don't see an end in sight. <laughs> you know, I, I covered one Winter Olympics in Turin and after one of his races, Bodie Miller skied to the bottom of the hill and, I, and he had lost by, you know, a couple tenths of a second or something. And I asked him about the margins and he said, yeah, you know, you ski down the mountain, you turn around, you look up at the scoreboard and you shrug your shoulders. That's skiing. These, these are tenths and hundreds of a second are so hard to process. But when you win so consistently, it says something about eliminating the, the, the margins. And that's what it seems Michaela Schifrin and every great skier does best. It's those tiny, tiny little imperceptible differences in the way one skier, in this case Schifrin, races versus the way her closest competitors are able to race. And I think that's a function of the, the level of de attention to detail that she has had to every aspect of her career. And when I say career, most people don't think of having a career, you know, when they're eight or what, but she really ha has sort of approached it that way very professionally from a very young age. And I think it's remarkable that, you know, kids like it's very few of them would have that opportunity and sort of the parents, you know, laying it out for them, giving them that opportunity, pushing them that direction and stick with it and not just throw up their hands and say, I want to be free. <laughs> but she always, I mean, from a very young age, she liked doing the drills, meticulous about that. I mean, the equipment, the, the level of detail you have to be at your equipment, everything from, I mean, yes, there's skis, skis, boots, bindings, but there's how each of those fit, how each of those are tuned, how they interface with each other. And it changes based on condition. The course changes not every day. Every racer that goes down it, it changes. So there are so many variables. And I think she's been the very best at at just controlling everything she can, which in ski racing is very hard to do. And, and it's interesting too, her margins used to be a lot, a lot bigger, especially in slalom. You know, in slalom, she dominated by so much. She had some huge, you know, over a second, I mean, approaching two seconds, which is crazy. And now they're much smaller, which also speaks to and when they're that small, when they're hundreds of a second, but you're still coming out on the right side of it. I mean, obviously the last slalom she didn't, but <laughs> give Lena Dora a do. Um, that that just shows you've you've got everything on your side working. So when the little little bit of luck comes your way, it's gonna go it's gonna go your direction. You mentioned her growing up and how she became a great skier. Tell us a little bit about the backstory. I know she grew up skiing in Vermont. Um, she trained more than she raced, which is very atypical for our youth sports culture, um, which prizes winning in it with kids instead of learning the craft. And she turned pro at 15 when she became the youngest ever U.S. Alpine champion. How different was her um, racing upbringing from that of other pros? Yeah, I think you're, you're, you're right. When, and actually, if you look right now in the circuit at Lara Coltori, the Albanian, she's actually an Italian. Her mother's a gold medalist, and they're doing very much the same thing very measured approach to racing. Um, and the Michaela raced much less than her peers, even from a very young age. She actually grew up skiing in New Hampshire at the same club that I coach at now and, and that my kids are coming through. And so I, I've heard a lot of the sort of the legend of Michaela. Um, and so they just concentrated on fundamentals. She loved doing drills. And most kids don't. They'll do drills for a run or two. You take your eye off them and they're in the woods building a jump. But she just had the mentality to be able to, to do that stuff. And then if you look at her c competition record, sort of the, the normal path is you, you move through the circuit domestically, you go to Europe, you hit the Europa Cup, you grind it away on the circuit there for a few years, then you go to the World Cup. She has four Europa Cup starts on her resume. That is it. So she just went right from, you know, sort of dominate at every level and then move on. And you know, by the time I think she, her first World Cup was maybe March of 2011, she was winning by December 2012. So it was a very, very quick rise. 
Now, the last image that most sports fans, casual fans, have of Michaela Schifrin is her sitting in the snow for like 20 minutes by the side of the slalom course at the Beijing Winter Olympics a year ago after she missed a gate and skied off the course for the second time in three days. It's an indelible sort of agony of defeat moment. I mean, one of the classics of all time. But what we, I think a lot of people don't remember is what Michaela Schifrin did after she got to the bottom of the mountain, which was to to do an interview with NBC and other media. I wanted to play the clip of of Schifrin at the bottom of the mountain that day. What are you still processing? Um, Pretty much everything makes me second guess like the last 15 years everything I thought I knew about my own skiing and slalom and racing mentality Um, just processing a lot for sure and I feel really bad Um, There's a lot more going on today than just my little situation, but I feel really bad for for doing that. I mean, it was heartbreaking, Edie. And my colleague at Slate, Justin Peters, wrote at the time, the bright side for Michaela Schifrin, if she can ever bring herself to see it, is that she's setting herself up for one hell of a redemption arc. I think he meant in the next couple days with the rest of the races. And that didn't happen, but the arc was just a little bit longer. But how did how does an athlete do what she did, which is to recover from the sort of global, what she would probably have described as humiliation? Yeah. Well, I think one of the things she did is she stuck around. You know, she could have, she could have gone home and not raced the speed event. She raced the speed event. She raced the team event, which she's never done. I think a lot of that had to do with her boyfriend. She's going out with this, you know, Norwegian guy, Alexander killed and they have a different mentality. I'm sure that was an enormous help. I mean, she said it was. And now, you know, down the road, you look at she's gone through her father's tragic death. She's gone through this Beijing thing. And <laughs> she said at the beginning of the year, you know, not finishing at the Olympics was not the worst thing that ever happened to me, not by a long shot. And I think she's been able to bring that perspective into her racing and into her career. And that, I think, also feeds into this sort of lightness and freedom you're seeing because, yes, she cares about the record. She cares about winning. She she wants nothing more than than winning. But she also sees that it it really... It's, it doesn't that matter that much in the big picture. And so, boy, I feel f- sorry for a competition because <laughs> that's, it's going to be tough to beat that. Yeah, if there's a before and after to, to Schifrin's career, it's, it's probably not the Beijing Olympics. It's probably the death of her father two years earlier at the beginning of the pandemic. And it was during the pandemic that she sort of made a conscious decision to change her public persona. Um, she was always sort of very crafted on social media. Her nickname was the robot or the machine. And then she decided to write about George Floyd and open up to her um, mental health issues following the death of her father. Um, and she seems like a different kind of athlete now. And maybe that, and that I, probably goes into that lightness that you mentioned and, and feeling like, hey, understanding I might not win another race, as she once told her mother, but she knows that I can go out there and compete and have fun doing it. Yeah, I think that... You know, that, like you said, that she used to sort of come off as an automaton and everything, just doing as she was told, the mother always there, you know, very tightly held cards. And I think certainly this, it, it has built her image enormously for people to see her human side and, and she's, she's going all in. (laughs) She, she shares a lot, but you know, it's great. I think it's, it's nice when you can see, an athlete that's that good who's also, you know, growing up and enjoying it, you know, to see her having a boyfriend and having friends and being more of a teammate and just like enjoying the ride. It's, it's, you know, it's a nice, it's nice for spectators too, to see that that can be done. All right. So Edie, we've got to wait a month now because the world championships uh, happen over the next few weeks and those don't count toward world cup totals. So what's next for Schifrin and how can Americans watch this because I have a funny feeling that there's going to be some increased media interest as she gets to Denmark's record. 
Yes. The, I mean, so the, the good thing that she didn't have the record yet is that people are going to tune in in March and keep, keep on World Cup skiing, watching World Cup skiing, which is great. The tough thing is how to watch it. The one place you can always see it is at U.S. Ski and Snowboard Live, but you do have to subscribe there. It's been a very tough thing. And if you look in the, all the comments on social media, people are like, how do I watch this? And, um, you know, it's definitely started out the season with a hodgepodge of commentators. Now they've got Steve Perino in you know, certainly for all of Michaela's races, and he is the best. Anytime you're watching ski racing with Steve Perino, you learn a ton, and it's and it's a great show. But then he also does Peacock and NBC cover it as well. I'm honestly not sure <laughs> how that how that shakes out. I think you sort of have to stay tuned. I wouldn't be surprised if things change and evolve. But during the World Championships, towards when we get to March, because so many people are going to be interested in this this record chase. And and Schifrin has nine more races in which to get her one victory or two to surpass the record. And probably another six or seven yeah. or eight years more. So why not? Yeah, seems, why not? Seems, <laughs> seems probable. <laughs> it does. Edt Morgan skied for the United States at the 1988 and 1992 Olympics. She writes for Ski and Ski Racing magazines and other publications. We'll post a link to her work on our show page. Ed, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Fantasy football leagues are won on the waiver wire and with trades and with savvy starter sit decisions. The Fantasy Football Today podcast will help you along the way with the best advice on how to manage your team and dominate your league. With eight episodes per week, Fantasy Football Today is the only resource you'll need. Start sit, grade the trade, fantasy cops to settle your league disputes, and so much more. Check out Fantasy Football Today anywhere podcasts are found. And now it is time for After Balls, sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice, endorsed by Kenny Sailors, who says it was okay. All right, we've got breaking news from Football Daily in the UK. Let's listen. In the last few minutes, Weston McKenney has arrived, as you see here, at Leeds Training Ground, ahead of his medical. USA midfielder is expected to join on loan from Juventus. That's with an option to buy, though. He'll join his international teammates, Tyler Adams and Brendan Aronson at Ellen Road. That was accompanied by video of McKenney getting out of a car. He'll be joining the American coach Jesse Marsh also, and I'm very excited about Leeds United States of America. To talk about it, I am joined for an exclusive afterball interview by Leander Sharlockens, who's been writing about the chaos in the U.S. men's national program for The Ringer and is working on a book about the team, currently titled The Long Game. Hey, Leander. How are you, Stefan? Great. Thanks for coming on the show. So first things first, we always, as you know, give the afterball segment a name. And I'm going to go with one of Weston McKenney's nicknames at his former club Juventus in Italy. He said a couple of years ago that veteran goalkeeper Gigi Buffon called him Big Mac and Cristiano Ronaldo dubbed him Texas Boy. And I have to say, Europeans coming up with totally obvious and lame American-style nicknames is so on brand but I think we should go with Texas boy. Fair enough. Yeah, it's it's not the atomic ants, what they called us, Sebastian Jovinko, but uh, it'll have to do. Yeah. All right, so let's start with the McKenney deal. I was already a Leeds convert because of its Americanization, and don't get me started on Jack Harrison, who went to prep school and some college in the United States, and there's got to be a way to get this guy naturalized. It's like Team America, which played in the North American Soccer League during the U.S.'s failed attempt to qualify for the 1986 World Cup, only better. Yeah, Team America came uh, came dead last and had the fewest goals scored in a crumbling NASL. So it's, it's a low bar to clear. What does it mean that we've got all these Americans playing there? Well, on the one hand, um, I think from a national team perspective, uh, there's a lot of positives there because what you tend to see with national teams that have a critical mass of players playing for the same club 
is that those synergies kind of transfer to the national team. And it's really hard to uh, build cohesive national teams because the players are together so rarely so that if you can kind of import that cohesion from their club teams, that's really, really useful. And so you tend to see that translate in the great national teams um, into, uh, you know, more sophisticated tactics that you can play at the international level, which is a big advantage. And for Leeds, this is like great marketing. Um, Jesse Marsh, the coach, has sort of played this down historically. In 2021, he uh, was interviewed by our friend, the late Grant Wall, and he said, when I first came, I tried to reiterate that there wasn't an Americanization of Leeds United. It's harder to make that case after two American transfers, now three, and with the San Francisco 49ers being part of the ownership group. I don't know why you even want to like play it down, right? I mean, the fans seem to like it at Leeds, and this is great marketing for American fans. I think so too. I mean, it's it's inroads into the the world's richest commercial market. I mean, there, there are a lot of Premier League teams that have been working awfully hard for a long time to to crack that market, and they've been doing preseason tours and postseason tours. And Leeds just has a natural in here for a team that otherwise I don't know how how appealing it would be for an American audience. So this to me seems like marketing gold for them. I think the downside from a an American perspective is what happens if Leeds gets relegated, right? Right now they're only one point above the relegation zone. There's a long way to go, but it's it's not at all inconceivable. And then suddenly you've got the spine of your national team playing in a second tier league. Or they get loaned out or sold after the season, which is also, of course, possible. But having these three guys there, um, you mentioned this cohesiveness factor. And for the national team, it can use some sort of positive media right now, as you wrote in The Ringer recently. Um, and we've talked about on this show, it's pretty much a state of chaos right now. And this points to, you know, the, there is no sporting director, there is no general manager for the men's national team, there is no coach for the men's national team, and there was the Greg Berhalter, Claudio Reyna kerfuffle, and that is lingering, and there's an investigation. And you take a broader lens on this, which is that that U.S. soccer is a very small organization. You wrote in The Ringer, while the governing body for the sport in the country has more than 100 employees, it's been dominated for decades by a tiny elite. And this is a country that has more than 12 million participants playing soccer. This is not great. No, it's not. And the in a conference call with reporters last week, um, the Federation president, uh, Sidney Parlo Cohn, was, was trying to sort of play this off as, well, this is an opportunity. We can sort of clear the deck. We can start over. Um, yes, but there's a World Cup coming in three and a half years, and there's a Copa America, uh, the South American championship that will be sort of exported to the U.S. offshore, if you will, uh, for a second time since, since 2016. That's happening in the summer of 2024. You've got CONCACAF Nations League. You've got Gold Cup. Um, these are all crucial opportunities to build a team that it, that's going to face some high expectations in 2026 and that did well in Qatar, but that has an awfully long way to go if it's going to live up to its potential. And so the fact that now you're going to be on an in, under an interim coach for what looks like a really long time, they talked about hoping to hire a uh, new sporting director and a new head coach by the end of the summer. You know, that's that's most of a year gone once again, it's sort of the last thing that this young team needs is for its momentum to be sort of interrupted in this way. One of the things that the recent stuff has illuminated is how everybody knows everybody, and this is a tiny little incestuous world. Um, isn't this a little bit inevitable, though? You know, the Reina, Berhalter, Ernie Stewart, 1990s generation was the first serious one in U.S. soccer, and they're all around 50 years old now, senior management age, and it's this small pool to choose from. How does that change? Yeah, no, that's that's a valid point, and that's that's something that people have pointed out as this counter argument to saying that U.S. soccer is incestuous. And you say, all right, well, if not these guys, then who? Which there there's some merit to that. Um, I do think that you know it it has been a small group that sort of split off from the from the same coaching tree. I mean, most of the guys that have been recent head coaches were Bruce Arena assistants at some point. He was the national team coach twice. There aren't that many people. 
um, in the US that can realistically do these jobs. But maybe that means it's time to start casting a wider net and, and looking in other places. I mean, as American soccer grows more global, as Major League Soccer grows more global, there are plenty of people um, who could do these jobs um, who understand the American game, who don't necessarily have American passports. So in, in that sense, uh, I think American soccer needs to get a little bit less parochial. And that will be the test in the next few months. Um, this coaching job, and the Federation has kept saying that Greg Berhalter is still a candidate, which is kind of shocking to me. But anyway, the coaching job isn't all that appealing. You did another piece for The Ringer uh, about why. Um, and when you stop to think for a minute, you realize that there are good reasons here. The U.S. doesn't have to qualify for the 2026 World Cup. They're in already because we're one of the hosts. Um, the, the job as a rule isn't that attractive because you don't do much. It's mostly a recruiting job um, because, as you mentioned, these windows for getting players together are few and far between. The U.S. ain't going to be playing a lot of games. The pay isn't great. And the U.S. has this notion, as you point out, of the head coach being the face of U.S. soccer more than just a coach and that speaking English and even living in Chicago where the Federation is based is important. Yeah, I mean, there's obvious appeal to the job in that you've got an exciting young team and a World Cup on home soil, but international soccer already sort of tends to get the second pick out of coaches because it's not where the exciting work gets done for the coaches who are sort of these generational brand names like Pep Guardiola and Jurgen Klopp. They want to be on the field with their team every day, sort of ironing out kinks and, and building these super sophisticated tactical schemes. And you just don't get to do that at the national team level where you're kind of doing a lot of HR and a lot of scouting and a lot of logistical stuff. Um, now you add on top of that, that U.S. soccer probably cannot afford to pay top dollar for one of these coaches, that um, the fact that there is no qualifying also means that there are a lot fewer competitive games. Uh, that's a downside in and of itself. And then you get to host a World Cup and you get to be the home team, but that also means having to deal with really unrealistic uh, expectations more often than not. Greg Berhalter um, actually said in an interview after his contract expired that the U.S. should be aiming to make the semifinals at the World Cup. Well, there are an awful lot of big teams and, and uh, you know, really reputable uh, countries at the last World Cup that did not make the semifinals. You know, Brazil didn't make the semifinals. Belgium didn't. Germany didn't. Spain didn't. That's a really high bar to clear. And that's probably the sort of expectations that you are going to be looking at. So in that sense... How high is the upside really? There is a lot to be said for this job, but there's also a lot of reasons not to want it. All right, last question real quickly. Why not just continue with a sort of interim approach with a good recruiter, scout, um, someone who's going to be talking to these dual nationals and try to persuade them to join the U.S. and wait until 2024 at some point or even early 2025 to try to land a big name coach. Is that a feasible strategy or do you need someone from the get-go that's going to be there through the World Cup in 26? My thinking had been that either Burhalter would be brought back quickly and then, of course, the investigation into an old domestic violence incident um, through a spanner in, in that or that they would take their time and find somebody else. The argument for waiting for a little while is that you might get a better coach and that somebody might be available then who's not on the market now, who maybe with a lead time of two years as opposed to three and a half is more interested in that job. Um, the argument against is that with a young team that you know still needs a lot of work and that just needs time together and reps together, um, you kind of need to maximize every international window and every game that you have. And when you're playing under an interim coach and then starting again with a new head coach who might have different ideas, that really complicates uh, that, that process. All right, Lander Sharlockens, working on a book about the U.S. men's national team. I'm sure you'll be tuning into Leeds as well. Thanks, Stefan. Thanks for coming on. 
That is our show for today. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. To listen to past shows and subscribe, go to slate.com slash hangup. You can email us at hangup at slate.com. And please subscribe to the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. For Joel Anderson and Josh Levine, I'm Stefan Fatsis. Remember Zelmo Beatty, and thanks for listening. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now.